That's that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, it's Larry Flick. Welcome to Let's Talk Music, a series where we gather some uh, great thinkers. I'm delighted, as always, to be joined in the co-pilot seat, Pete Lowry Winfield. So you know Pete from his many creative endeavors, and he's also the creative mastermind behind Until the Ribbon Breaks. We're also joined today by a remarkable young talent who has been very bravely um, documenting his life, both through song and through film. Uh, his name is Brandon Stansel. Hello, Brandon. Hi, Larry. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. And then we have this remarkable fella. He is um, what you would call not just a jack of all trades, but a master of many. He is a um, business developer for Rival Magazine, and he is also a publicist for Purple Bite. His name is Mikel Corrente. Thank you, Larry. Glad to be here. This is the one about mental health, but I wanted to begin with a, a simple question, and that is, how has your mental health affected your relationship with music and to music, whether it's as a listener or as a creative? And uh, why don't we start with Brandon? It's kind of funny because when I was a little kid, um, I always gravitated towards really sad music. When I was kind of a young adult, I had this theory that I gravitated towards sad music because I really just never, that wasn't something that I felt a lot. I didn't feel those like heavy, heavy emotions. Um, and then, you know, after I came out, I, you know, I started to write about my experiences and a lot of those were you know, pretty hard and heavy. And I was able to kind of um, use my writing and use music as this outlet to kind of grieve. And, um, and also it was, you know, kind of on the flip side, looking back, it, uh, it served as this great, you know, cathartic thing, because a lot of what I've written about, you know, whether it be my coming out experience or, you know, breakups or just any kind of heartbreak, really, um, when I look back on it, I realize that I don't really feel that way anymore um, because there has been so much growth that's happened. And what, what about you, Pete? How does your state of mind inform your music? I love that, by the way, Brandon. I, I really relate to that sense of um, it being a catharsis and maybe you don't even know it at the time, right? Um, and that only makes sense later. But... Um, yeah, until a ribbon breaks specifically, it's funny if I'm making, if I'm writing or producing with other people or for other people, it's, it, you, you sit in the opposite chair, I suppose, if it was like a therapy session, you, I, I'm there to go like, so how, what's going on and what, how do you want to feel about it? And so therefore there's an immediate barrier and it, I, I, I'm trying to experience or relate to what they're feeling and we turn it into a song it's a job right it's a it's a process and if i hear an until a ribbon break song i that's the only time i realize how i feel about something it's like there's a subconscious coming through that i am blocking in any other part of life and when i write for some reason it comes out and sometimes that's heavy and dark and it's just a way of it coming out i think so very much it's a, like you said, Brandon, a catharsis. And for me, it's a release, a release of things. I don't often feel like I can, can communicate or even want to communicate in a conversation or, a, yeah. So it's only through music sometimes I feel like I can do that. So, Mikkel, you and I have different roles in the creative world and that we're both curators and we're both people who are, try to be vessels um, for fans of music and art to consume. Tell me about your relationship and your mental health and your state of mind and how you move through music. Yeah, I, I think it has changed through the years so much. Uh, mostly, you know, being a, 
a Latin man. I came to the U.S. when I was 20. Uh, and being from a culture that I love many, many things about my culture, but one thing that I had to deconstruct was the strong man. You have to always be cool, always like not be vulnerable. That's a lot of that in my culture that it's been years and years of deconstruction and every time it's more and more. And I think that lately what I do when I'm feeling uh, a certain emotion, whatever it is, I try to connect with it and befriend it and listen to music that would help me befriend it too. So if I'm feeling sad, I'm like, okay, I got to feel sad right now. And this is what I, what I need to connect with. So I'm going to listen to music that's going to help me go through that. If I feel happy, you know me, I'm going to play some reggaeton and dance, <laughs> but it's just like, it depends. I, I, really working on just like listening to myself and being vulnerable and, and honest with all the emotions I'm feeling. Or would any of you say that you are, when you're listening, would any of you say that you're wallowers or do you reach for music to pull you out of it? Well, you know, I thought it was, I, I love what Mikel just said. I've never really thought of it like that where, you know, mm. you have a feeling and you try to befriend it. I think in my own way, I've kind of always done that uh, instinctively too in a way it was like I don't try to fight it I just but I don't really feel like a wallow in it either I just accept that that's how I'm feeling and I I tend to listen to music that kind of not reinforces it but feels the same way I do um, it kind of makes me feel like I'm not going through whatever I'm going through alone whether it's you know, and I think, I, I think, I think that's a very natural thing to do. I, I don't, I, you know, if I'm sad, I don't put on happy music. I don't know that a lot of people do that. You know, I, I think the temptation or not the temptation, but I think then, you know, at least for me, the natural thing is to just accept the feeling and, and, you know, wade through it. You know, it's very funny though. Um, I'm often very much the same way as you, Brandon. But today in here in Wales, it's a, it's a grim, gray, classically UK kind of day. I know it's fabulous, Pete. Um, and today I thought if I listen to a sad song, I'm going to be irretrievable and not productive. So I was I've been sitting at my desk in this very dark room listening to disco music because I needed something to keep me from going too far down the, the rabbit hole. Now, yeah. Pete... I know you're a wallower just because my my spidey senses tell me. Am I right? Yeah. I sorry. Is it is it how you say Mikel or Michael? How do you pronounce Mikel? Mikel. I love what you. I was reading a book yesterday, and something um, in it said uh, you are you're either running from or to, and I loved what you were saying about um, your thing being that like you actually fully and not only fully embrace the emotion, but you, you source out how to feel more of it, even if it's necessary, even if it's like deemed as a bad emotion. And I think that's a really important point because I think a huge problem I always had was judging the feeling that you're having rather than just feeling it right. Is that sad is only sad if you attach your reaction to that feeling. There's something really cinematic to me about feeling something and then putting on music. For me, music's always been an incredibly like headphones experience. You know, it's just like me and the music and walking down the street and, and being part of your own kind of movie. And if that's the scene where it's sad, then that is a different movie and, and you can soundtrack that. It's more like what Mikel said, it's, it's wallowing, but almost intentional. Sometimes, you, you know, you have to kind of put yourself through that, right, in order to come out from the other side. I don't ever intentionally listen to music to kind of feel sad. I kind of have to be there first. But once I'm there, if I don't kind of like experience it, the danger is I'm not going to come out of it. How do you use music to work through something? Well, I'll say two things on that. Um, one, to your point, and kind of what I was saying earlier, like when, you know, when I was a kid and I used to gravitate toward like sad music, but as an adult, I think, you know, when I really 
had that first taste of what it feels like to be depressed um, and be um, just in a hole you didn't think you could get out of. Um, for a long time, I was scared to listen to that kind of music because I had realized the limitations of my humanity and my ability to, you know, as we Southerners say, you know, pick ourselves up by the bootstraps, right? It's like, there's only so much grit you got. Um, and there's some things that are bigger than you are. And, uh, and so I, I remember for a long time, I kind of sh shied away from certain types of music, but I'll say as a, as a writer, I've always, and Larry, you know this, you know, I've, I've always just written very personally about, you know, my experience and a lot of it has been heavy. Um, but one thing I've, you know, always, you know, I feel like I always do when I sit down to write, especially that kind of music is, I really don't have to think anything up. I just have to sit there and wait till it comes down. Um, and it eventually does in, you know, in, in, in ways, uh, in its own way. And, um, you know, and then it's, it's just that process again of like getting it on paper and getting it, you know, you know, out um, of me and into the world that is healing in its own way. I think for two reasons. One, it's because at least for me, I've gotten to say something that I didn't, I didn't know how to say, maybe didn't know how to say before. Um, but then it has also been like this thing that has, you know, a lot of my songs are, that was a moment in my life that I never wanted to forget. I didn't want to forget how painful it was, but I wanted to move on from it. I didn't want, I didn't want myself or, you know, anyone close to me to like, not remember that this happened uh, because it was important and it was significant. Um, so it's recorded now. But now I can, now that it's there, I can, I can go, I can move on. I can step into a kind of a brighter space. But so Pete, as Brandon was saying that I'm thinking, okay, so what happens when you go to that place that allows you to write something beautiful and brutal and honest? How do you know you're going to come out of it and finish and that you're not just going to fall prey to the emotion of it all. I think the only way to survive, I suppose, uh, if you a career in this is to be able to somehow, as difficult as it can be sometimes, is find the the line where you get enough harness on the kind of vulnerability and the emotions of it all to be able to execute something that goes out into the real world, and that is really difficult. And I think that is where a, a lot of creative struggle in a mental health way, because those aren't natural partners, you know, like um, I'm feeling, I'm expressing, and therefore I have to go into this kind of like ethereal, insane place sometimes. And then someone's like, and can we have it by Tuesday? <laughs> and those, those, those two things aren't necessarily good bed partners so it's it's i think sometimes it's to in, to answer you to how do you execute that god if i knew the proper answer to that there'd be more until the ribbon breaks music in the world you know i don't sometimes the song lets you finish it and and other time and, and that's also why i think we need teams i think it's really important to surround yourself with people who go no, I love that you're expressing yourself, but do you want this out into the world or don't you? And being able to do that with love and care and not pressure, I think it's really important. Because an artist on their own saying, I don't need anyone, it's like, well, good luck with that because that's going to be really tough. Mikkel, one thing that I often wrestle with myself as, as a curator, and, and I'm curious to know how you handle this, is where do you where do you draw the line between being helpful and knowing that it might not be a good idea to put something out there it might not be the right time for it it might be tone deaf because of the times we're living in or it might be just a little too triggering it's something that i i'm becoming more aware of the more in touch with my own mental health issues i become um, and I do feel like, you know, folks like you and I have a responsibility to make those decisions that, you know, 
doesn't censor the artist, but, the, but we do have to make certain calls. So how do you make those calls? Yeah, it's a good question, Moose. I was sort of uh, what what Pete was talking. I was sort of thinking back to uh, myself, and I'm a, I'm a true extrovert. So before all that I did was like when I was feeling down, I would go out. I would go out because that's how I would recharge. That's a good extrovert. But then I didn't have that option anymore. <laughs> oh my God, I had that moment, right? And I started to look at things with way more um, compassion and way more understanding than I've ever did before. I think that, you know, as, uh, as somebody that like works with artists, either on the PR front, on the magazine front, think having a conversation with the, with the artists, understanding where they're coming from. It, it, like Pete was saying, like, I was that person that was like, okay, well, we need this by Tuesday, you know, like, Let's get it. Like that was that was me, <laughs> and I, and I think about it right now. And I'm like, okay, well, let me talk to the artist. Let me see what's going on. Let me try to understand instead of just being like, you need to do this. It's like, okay, let's talk. What's what's going on? And sometimes the best answer is to be okay. The Tuesday is not the right day, and we're gonna push it more, and that is fine. Uh, talking to the team, understanding because it's all a group effort, and and understanding what everybody's at, even though sometimes it goes against what we want. And that is fine too. Uh, it's frustrating and like, it's fine to feel frustrated, but, but just really listening. I think that's been like a massive learning experience for me this last year and a half, which is like, listen and mostly to the creators, just being right there with them. And, Cause they're, they're being the most vulnerable party as a business person. Yeah. We just put it out there and we like help it to get traffic, but the artist is the one that's being more vulnerable. How long does it take for you to feel comfortable to share? It's always fascinating to me what it takes to pour yourself into a song and then feel brave enough to share that song. I know on a completely different level that when I'm writing, you're not reading it until I've created a safe distance from it otherwise you can't see it when and how do you know it's safe particularly because you're both ostensibly solo artists you 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 both from my point of view function in in somewhat of a cocoon like scenario before you share it's interesting because I don't think we do operate in a vacuum. At least I, I, I don't. I mean, because I co-write with uh, other people. I rarely write by myself. Um, and then I have my producer who gets, you know, kind of is a filter too. I've taken in songs that I like and <laughs> got shot down because <laughs> it didn't fit a record or it just, it, he knows me so well now. He's seen the goods, uh, you know, and so when I don't bring them, um, I go back home <laughs> and start again. But then, okay, so I'm going to jump in. I'm going to jump in and I'm going to say, okay, Brandon, so in your mind, how do you decide what you're even going to share with that person? How long does it take for you to trust that person enough to be 100%? Yeah, I mean, so I, I know that I'm kind of married to a song when I can't get it out of my head and when I, when I know that I have to do it. Um, and there's just a, there's a big difference. You know, I've left sessions being like, that's a great song. I like it. Maybe I'll do it. Um, and then I've left sessions where I say, I've been wanting to write that for years and I couldn't ever pen it. And today I did. And that's going on the record, no matter what. And I don't care what anybody says. Um, so there, I don't know. There's just a different visceral feeling I, I get when I'm done with a song. If I'm on the fence about something, I will present it that way. I'll say, you know, here's some, here's some stuff. Let's take a listen. But if I know it's something I want to do, I don't present it like that. I say, this is the song we're recording it. Uh, and we kind of move forward. Is it easier when it's a set happier song? It kind of flows both ways. You know, the, the last time you, you and I talked, I, uh, I told you, I, I was walking into a session that afternoon and we ended up writing the, what will be the last song on this record. And it was one of those, I, you know, I had, I had, um, 10 nieces and nephews that I don't really know. And um, that was kind of one of the fallouts of my coming out. 
Um, but I, I had always wanted to pen something for them and, mm. you know, just to kind of be like, Hey, I'm here. Um, and, uh, you know, but it's, it's hard to, it, it's always been hard to like try to explain, um, to young kids, you know, if, and when I see them, uh, why I'm not a part of their life, uh, really mm. that's heavy and it's tough and you can't really talk to a 10 year old like that. Um, especially when you are not in good relationship with, you know, their parents. Um, but I wanted to write something and I finally did. And, oh, I, it was exactly what I wanted to say. And it's going on the record. And it just, it was just one of those things where it, I just felt like it kind of was like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, this is how it works. Like I have these things in my life that I feel like need a life outside of me because I know that this experience doesn't just happen to me, you know? And that's, I think, I think that kind of is my answer to your question. Like in a way I'm kind of able to, even though they are so personal to me, I'm, I'm able to disassociate them when I put them out into the world because I know I'm not the only one that has that, that's had that experience. I'm not the only one in this position. And so it makes me feel like a part of a larger community of people when I actually get it out onto a record or, or into the world. Pete, Pete, before you say anything, I, I'm, as, as uh, Brandon was talking, I went back to our very first conversation and I asked you about a passage of one of your songs. And, and I climbed so far inside it that I felt like I knew you. And, and I was like, so where did you find the courage to play that for anybody so that I could find, to hear, find a way to hear it? This feels like something you go through regularly. Well, Brandon, and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, just from what you just said, and um, I really, really, you know, I had chills when you were speaking because, um, you know, full transparency, I, I didn't think I was ever going to make an Until the Ribbon Breaks record again. I'm currently working on one, and it's been five years since I made one because the last one I made was in the eye of the storm of a, 15 year bad drug and alcohol addiction, right? And then I got sober halfway through making that record. I took from what you said, um, and again, you know, I met you 10 minutes ago, but um, for me, what's changed now and what feels like such a lift and such a relief is that you can't, hurt me more than I've hurt myself. You can't. No review, no opinion on my music. You can't get close to the things I've said to myself in my head. So it's actually through getting sober and going through that, you know, like, like with enough distance from these things, I think you're able to somehow found, find a way and um, to realize that it's what you needed at the time however hard and Brandon I don't know what you went through but even when you said you you uh you don't get to speak to your 10 nieces and nephews that's incredibly sad especially if it's born out of a you coming out that's just a tragedy but but from what I got from what you said and how you come across is that all that experience has just given you a thicker skin right Oh, for sure. I kind of say it in a, in a little bit of a different way. Um, you know, I, I always, I kind of think about my darkest, you know, time is when, you know, the years are right after I came out and then like looking back at those now, um, it just, it, I didn't know if I was ever going to get out of that. And now that I have, it just, it just has like, put me on this like new kind of level where it's like, there's not a lot that really gets to me anymore, you know, that really sends me. Um, I, I'm just, it, it tempered me um, in a way that not, I don't think a lot of things can. I think, you know, probably sobriety is, is something, you know, similar to that. I guess it, when it comes to writing and stuff, it, it, it um, I found a lot of freedom in it. So Mikkel, when you are, immersed whether it be as a business developer as a publisher as a publicist particularly as a publicist and you're you're dealing with artists who have 
both the strengths and the frailties that these two fellows are talking about. And it's so ingrained in what they're putting out into the world. How does that inform your process and how you deal with them? Again, through the years, changed so many times. And, and right now, my process right now is remember that music, we're, in, we're like to Pete, Pete, you mentioned that this is a hard uh, business. And uh, the reason why I think it's hard is because it's art driven, which means that it's subjective. There is no formula. There is no anything that you could do to really know if something's going to connect with somebody or not. Because ultimately, everybody, even in this conversation, everybody acts sort of like as mirrors, reflections of each other. So if we go through a hard time together, you're going to look at that song and be like, oh, I relate to this. Just like you said, you're in a happy time. You're going to be able to relate to this. So that's why I try to understand where the artist is at. Because the reality is, like, even when choosing a song, like you said before, Larry, like, well, you have to choose a song. What if it's the right song? What if it's not the right song? And to Brandon, I trust the intuition. Like, if you tell me this is the song I really want because it's the song that I'm connecting with 100%, I'm so sure that this is it. I'm like, sure, that's it. If that's how you feel, that's how you feel. And that's what we're going to do. When do you, Mikel, because this is something that I debate with um, other journalists and broadcasters all the time. And, um, and I've actually had strong debates with bosses about this, that what we're really talking about here is a union of two different types of art. You know, I'm not an artist the way Brandon or Pete are because I'm not capable of it. But the way I approach things, the way I think about things, the way I talk about things as I've gotten older, and this is something that comes with age and really fucking up. Um, this is my offering. And it's creative in some fashion. So when do you start to see that what this is, is a dance? And that it's not just, you know, when I, whenever I talk to people, friends of mine who work in the business and they're like, well, that's, you know, they're moving units. This is product. I just kind of go, Bleh. you know, and that's why I stopped doing things the way I did them 10 years ago, because I don't fucking care about product. I mean, I have the same conversations, but then when it's time for me to actually do utilize things in my work, if I don't, if I don't like it, it ain't happening. If I don't like the person, you ain't coming on my show. You're not doing the Zoom. I'm not talking about you. Go find someone else because all we have is our credibility. How do you you know, marry your art with theirs. Yeah, emotionally is where I decide if I like somebody or not. Because musically, you know, there might be a style or there might be something I don't particularly like, but I could objectively say, okay, this is good. I could place this, even though if it's not my cup of tea. Uh, but emotionally, I think that that's when I draw that line. Like if I talk to the person and I'm like, oh my God, this person sees me as a... Uh, as an object, like, oh, you're gonna do this for me because of that. And right. like, no, like if once we lose that humanity is when I like, I'm out. So, you know, there's a, there's a cliche, Brandon and Peter, that you can't write a good record if you're happy. Absolute bullshit. And <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm allowed to say that because I bought into that. And I have definitely been on both sides of that. So I can fully experience both sides enough to have a justified answer. And that is that that is the biggest load of shit because it's such a self indulgent idea that you have to make yourself miserable. Like who, who's asking you to do that? <laughs> like, and if someone is asking you to do that, don't ever speak to that person again. Right, so unless it's coming, if if it's authentic, like Larry, you said it all. If if it's authentic and coming from an authentic place, and you're making something because it's how you feel, absolutely make it. 
But if you're if you're having to put on an emotion and the one you reach for is self-destruction because you think that's the only way you're going to make your art, who wins? None of us. Like, and I, I again, I say that because I, I did that for two records. I think there's a, a responsibility that needs to be taken by the industry to which is that, that that is a falsehood and that it's okay to say, no, no, let's get you better. I just, you, you look at the past and you look at all, look at Amy Winehouse, man. I can't even say her name without feeling so sad because we won't get another record and you watch the documentary and it's even her own family are like promoting this idea of destruction because it's selling records, it's selling newspapers, everyone's getting bigger, more famous and richer and then she's dead. Is that and then and then we go on to romanticize it as the she's this icon and uh, well I'd rather have more records than a than a than she be an icon. So Brendan, you know we when um when I interviewed you for a column for Rival that will be coming out soon, um we talked about how this new EP, which again is called This Must Be the Place, that there are elements of this record that are brighter than your first recordings and that they feel like they reflect more the person I met a year ago because I feel like I know you to be a pretty vibrant light guy um, but a lot of your music has been cathartic would you say you're able to write head now that you're in a better place in your life I think saying even the way the question is is positioned is like you're assuming that you're either in a wildly depressed state or you're just exuberantly happy and that don't think that is ever the case for a person i think that most people have their good days and have their bad days and they kind sure. of fall fair enough show, right so i have you know my heavier my last ep was heavy but it was heavy on purpose it wasn't necessarily because i was going through all those emotions all at the same time all at that one time in my life you know th these were things i had experienced over the past decade and i just thought at that particular moment in tandem with this documentary that i was working on um, about my coming out experience there were just very specific heavy things that i thought that queer people experience all the time, but they never get written about because they are deemed as unimportant or they are deemed as they didn't hurt that bad or they you are gaslighted into believing they never happened at all. And so it was really important that I write that record and write it as honestly and truthfully as I could. And it came out real heavy. <laughs> but my personality is not like that. I think you feel that. And I think if you know me, it definitely feels a lot more like me because there is, you know, there is, it's light. And, and there's wit to it and there is heart to it. Um, and like I said, the, you know, the song that uh, we just recorded this, um, this weekend, it, I mean, I wrote it and then I listened, was listening to the work tape just to try to figure out, you know, over and over and over again, just to figure out how I was gonna sing it when I went into the studio on Sunday and I was driving to get coffee and I was just a mess coming back to the house and, um, because it just hit me so hard and it, and and it's just so sad to me and it breaks my heart and but it's the only song like that on the record um and and so i think that like when this thing is all said and done you're it's going to feel like this and i don't think that anyone would look at it and be like wow he's he must be going through a great time in his life <laughs> i think that it comes across as as a normal person um, experiencing a wide range of emotions at any given point. So we've been talking a lot about process. We've been talking a lot about curation. We've been talking a lot about what happens in the buildup to presenting art, whether it be as an artist or as a journalist or publicist. So now your music is out there. The content is out there. People are having a reaction. They feel like they know you. They feel, they feel all kinds of things. Um, and then you go out there into the world one way or another and you have to receive that. And on one hand, that's a beautiful thing. How, how do you deal with 
the mental health of others, the mental health of your audiences based on what you've been putting out into the world. Something interesting happened this week. I, um, a bunch of my stuff got redistributed. It was a wacky kind of thing on uh, Facebook and my distributor had to redistribute the series of music videos. So the hometown video got redistributed on Facebook and I didn't know this, but I looked down and it had been, you know, all of these comments just flooding in, it like like it had just come out yesterday. And this is a video that came out in 2018. Um, and I, you know, I haven't tapped into any of it, but I've just kind of been watching and seeing people interact with each other, sharing their stories. And, you know, a lot of it is, you know, sad and like a lot relatable to what I went through. Um, and then, you know, some of it is not and I was, I was in this weird temptation where I was like, am I curating this? Like, what am I doing? But it was nice to just like see that conversation was being engendered about, you know, what it means to be queer and Southern and like, and I don't know, I just, it felt like, again, like it was just nice to uh, feel like something that you created was a catalyst for hopefully some, you know, forward movement and change and, um, I don't know. I know that doesn't completely answer your question. I would like to jump in here uh, because honestly, like this entire thing gets me riled up a little because like thinking about it, I'm just like society wise, we have been taught to idolize pain and connect through pain and connect through hurt and connect through suffering. We haven't been taught to connect through abundance. And I think it's a balance. Like we should connect through both of them. Wow. But it's pretty wild that you know, like even with friends, like I think it's every human's responsibility as an artist, as a human in general, to be able to be your full self. Like when you're suffering, being able to, to suffer and like to be able to see it. And when you're thriving, when you're full of abundance, be able to do that as well and not be judged because I think that what happens, and you could see this, this is a little tangent, but you could even see this in parties or anything. Like if you go to a place and you're like, wow, I'm feeling hot today. Like you said that people are going to look at you and say like, wow, that person's conceited. That person is did. That person's that. On the other end, if you're like, oh, I had a really shitty day. People are, oh my God, tell me what's up. Like people are way more empathetic towards suffering than what they are towards abundance. And I think this is that something that we, the entire world as a society, we decided to honestly keep people oppressed because when you're, kept from abundance you 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 don't make the best decisions when you're in an abundance mentality you're gonna make your best decisions uh, Mikhail, what something that i thought about when you were speaking is I, I really think that something we're missing societally or need more of is the ability for us to be able to not even necessarily disagree but be able to freely express ourselves if we're not hurting somebody and without having to have fear of being told what you should, what the latest thing you can or can't say is. And um, where I find that real problem, um, what did I, I saw this quote the other day that Twitter is now the editor of the New York Times. And I thought that was really powerful because I feel it's really uh, a dangerous place when artists specifically are tempering or uh, watering down the things that they want to say because they're worried about this like group mentality of thou shalt not when that thing changes every day anyway so this idea that we're all trying to fit into some box that we don't even know where the box is going or what it is is really difficult and so Someone told me the other day that Pumped Up Kicks, you know, that song was about from the perspective of, of a school shooter. And it mm -hmm. blew my mind because because it's over these happy, it's the most buoyant, da, 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 it's like a nursery rhyme. And then you and then not only you start singing it and you're like, oh, my God. And the person who was telling me was like, so therefore they should never have made it. I, I feel like it's problematic to bestow onto an artist the responsibility of other people's feelings, especially as a society as a whole. 
how if if we as artists feel like we have to take that on we got no, what do we write songs about if we if it's not a reflection of what's going on well you're talking about the difference between <clears throat> emotional connection and commentary right to me a song like pumped up kicks which is about exactly what what you you know the person told you it was really more of a satirical jab at the times we live in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to say that song shouldn't have been made would be to say that we shouldn't have satire and commentary any more than you know a song about someone's hometown or you know emotional disconnection is dangerous because it's going to trigger people who have issues of depression there's a line between artist responsibility and human responsibility i always cringe when <clears throat> I talk to artists, and I'm like, so why are you doing this? And they say, because I want to be a role model. And I'm like, well, if you want to be a role model, the Peace Corps is looking for volunteers. You don't go into making records to be a role model. You go into records to be an artist. And, you know, the, 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 the moment of Yahtzee is when I tell people that I know Brandon Stansel, and Paul Winfield, <laughs> gotcha. Um, and they say, holy shit, you know them? Their record means this to me. Their record means that to me. To have the three of you here to contribute to a conversation uh, about the energy of the world is very, very important. And I'm really grateful to the three of you uh, for that because I know, you know, one of the things that I infuse my offering to the world is to try to be as empathetic with the people who consume my work to understand what the potential is. And I know that when someone listens to a Brandon Stansel record, they may not make an irrational decision about their life that day. I know that if they listen to an Until the Ribbon Breaks record, they're going to, they're going to find a catharsis to blow off some steam and feel exhausted in a really powerful, good way. I know that when they look at the beautiful art that Mikkel helps bring into the world, that they see the potential to contribute their own art, whether it be as a photographer, as a writer, as a model, as an artist, you know, the contributions the three of you make are remarkable. So let that soak in while I uh, bring up our final question. And it's one that we bring up at the end of every one of our Vero Let's Talk Music gatherings which is first and last and this is very simple first record you bought last record you listened to first record i bought was amy grant heart in motion <laughs> um the last record i listened to is casey musgraves star crossed and what did you get from those records well, you know me, Larry. I love a good, I love a good sad song, and Casey Musgraves just got me a whole record full of them. So <laughs> I know it's her divorce record. I was, uh, I was tickled to death. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, how about you, Mikkel? My records are so niche. I don't think <laughs> I mean like niche because like my first record I bought was a Venezuelan ska band called Desorden Publico, and they are like I would love to go to their concerts. And I was like ten, eleven, or twelve, like like all the way till like I went to a reunion a few years ago. They came to LA, and like I just loved being able to connect with that like scout you know <laughs> that moment and uh the last record i listened to also in spanish which is funny um j balvin's jose like j balvin's just put a record which is amazing really good record boys to men cooley eye harmony was the first record i bought on cassette wow uh, yeah still to this day incredible incredible record they're the ultimate boy band for me. Um, and then the last record I listened to was America by Paul Simon, because I'm trying to figure out how to cover it, and it's proving difficult. In 2020, I really recommend going listening to that song through the lens of 2021. It's just, oh, my God. Larry, I, without... Uh, I'm just going to land this one on you. I thought we should just do a new segment where I ask you... A, we ask you a question. 
Okay, well, let me first tell you my first and last, and then you can ask me a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so my first record was a 45 uh, Michael Jackson cover of Rock and Robin. It was the first record I ever bought with my own allowance. I was a little boy, um, and it was the corniest record ever. And the last record I listened to is a song called How Beautiful Life Can Be by a band from uh, Wigan called The Lathams. Oh, wow. and it's and it's 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 one of those great strummy, classically British uh, alt pop records um, that I just love. So it's, it's been making me feel good on this rainy day. All right, hit me. We were talking earlier about um, the catharsis of the releasing things, and you were saying how you you kind of procrastinate and read and read and read, and you know once something's gone into the world my kind of catharsis is to just almost pretend it didn't happen and start working on something else or and then over time I see people comment or send me a message and it's like a kind of beautiful reminder that that thing exists but my question to you is that where do you get your sense of catharsis and at what point in in your writing about music or your you know a career of pushing up other people where do you get your feeling of catharsis if i'm writing about something or even if i'm talking about something in a broadcast environment if i feel like i found the words to be convincing and sincere then i feel like i've uh i've i've succeeded and so the catharsis part comes from because it's not good enough to say it's got a good beat and you can dance to it because, you know, we now live in a world where everyone's a music critic, everyone's a journalist, everyone's a podcaster. And the only way you can differentiate yourself from my point of view is to bleed a little. You have to set the table, let them know that you're coming from a very honest place and you're going to tell them truth. And even if it's truth that they don't like, you're going to tell them. And know, they'll know in that that they're safe to believe you, trust you. And that means laughing with you, getting mad at you, whatever. And so when it comes to music, um, if I can, I, I can't listen to music that I can't hear the words clearly and crisply to. I need to feel like the, the singer is sitting right here telling me. So that when records are mixed, where the vocals are mixed too far down, it's just noise and it's usually not something I'm going to relate to. So it, once, they're sit, once they're sitting on my shoulder, I then feel like I, I, I start looking for things about the artist that I can respond to and relate to, whether it be because they're queer whether it be because they've dealt with addiction, whether it's because they've dealt with anxiety or stress or they're silly, it doesn't always have to be heavy. Um, and then I have, to, I have to find myself inside the song, find a story about myself inside the song, and then find a way to tell that story. Once I can tell that story, then it goes from being me saying that's a great record to being my offering and my collaboration with an artist. And that becomes very cathartic and very satisfying. And, you know, I didn't learn how to really do that until I turned 50 after I had open heart surgery. I've been kind of doing it, but doing it from a safer distance. Now there's no distance. Now I just say it because what the fuck? I almost died. Can we also agree based on that, that your memoir is going to be called Open Heart? <laughs> uh, yes yes well, I, I started i've started writing so i'll let you know i fully support that i will <laughs> with that i'm larry flick and i want to thank uh brandon mikhail and pete for joining us the uh the current ep by brandon stansell is called this must be the place you should also also check out his uh, documentary three chords and a lie uh, Mikhail Corrente is the um, is the publicist for Purple Bite, and he's also the business developer for Rival. And Rival is in hard copy and in digital. And I write a column for the digital. 
Uh, Pete Winfield is my co-pilot and he's working on a new Until the Rhythm Breaks album and he is contributing tons of really cool stuff to Vero. So if you're not already following him, how dare you? And, um, and I'm here hoping for the best. Be sure to, uh, to join the conversation with the hashtag Let's Talk Music on Vero because these are the people you're going to find there. Like-minded folks of all different walks of life but we have one thing in common. We love music and we love to talk about it. I'm Larry Flick. You know what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about.